Welcome to Evidence for Faith as we are continuing our series on Give Me a Reason to Believe. And as we're looking through this, this is again uh, a series that we've been, we just finished doing down on a marine biology trip. But we wanted to make it available for all of you, not just those who went with us to Florida, but for everybody to be able to hear this. And this lesson here in this series is called Evidence for the Resurrection. Now, this is a very important lesson. Uh, this one, matter of fact, is the whole uh, foundation of Christianity is the resurrection. Throughout history, there have been emperors, there have been uh, dictators, uh, and many other world leaders, kings and others who have tried to destroy Christianity. What they usually do in doing so is they usually attack the Bible. They try and go after the Bible to disprove the Bible. Well, throughout the centuries, they've not been able to do that. That doesn't work. That's not how you defeat Christianity. You want to know how to defeat Christianity? Disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you can do that, you destroy Christianity. Thing is, in 2,000 years, no one's been able to really do that. Oh, some will publish a book and they'll come up with some ideas. But we're going to talk about that. That's what we're going to look at today. I'm, I'm going to take you through a little short journey here, uh, very quickly, about different ideas to try and explain the resurrection that are often used by skeptics today. And what I'm going to do is, using logic, I'm going to show you how illogical those examples or those reasons that they have or their beliefs on it, how ridiculous they are. Um, not meaning to be facetious. I'm not trying to cause a, a fight between, you know, different uh, ideas and stuff and ideologies against Christianity. I'm just trying to show and will show just logic dictates that Jesus was resurrected. Now, to be resurrected, <laughs> there's something you have to require first to be resurrected, and that is you have to die. So, now, Jesus um, has, of, uh, of course, this is 2,000 years ago, and Jesus was dead. Now, there are many people today who say that Jesus did not die, as it is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They say, no, he didn't die that way. Actually, I came across one time a college professor who said to me, he says, oh, don't you know that Jesus actually didn't die by crucifixion there in, in Jerusalem? I was intrigued. Like, well, what do you think happened? He says, I believe he married Mary Magdalene and then traveled over to what is present day France and lived there in hiding and developed a family, et cetera, et cetera. And he went on, on and on about this. And I was like, looking at his face, I could tell he was serious. And I was like, hmm, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And if, if you've heard of this theory, I mean, it's sort of gaining some popularity today, but the, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny whatsoever because there are so many independent sources, not just Christian sources. Yes, we Christians use the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. We, I believe that there's no errors in this outside of like spelling of names or places that what God gave us in the original autobiography that we call the Bible is accurate and is without error. I do believe that. And that's what a lot of our whole ministry is built upon is trying to show people that precise point right there. But others will say, well, um, Jesus possibly, you know, they'll say Jesus didn't actually die by crucifixion. Well, let's go back and let's take a look at some, some historical ideas on this and, and evidence that Jesus was crucified, that he did die and was crucified. And we won't even go to, to um, Christian sources. Let's go to non-Christian sources because there are plenty of these that we could go to that talk about these Roman historians, Greek historians that mention, even Jewish ones, mentioning the death of Christ by crucifixion. Tacitus, one of the Roman uh, uh, historians back um, just at the latter part of the Apostles, around 115 A AD, he wrote a book that's called The Annals, and you can buy it today or you can um, download it on the internet and stuff like this. I have a copy of it myself. And in The Annals, what we would call like chapter 15, section 44, he describes the death of Jesus. Now, he's a Roman historian. He is not a Christian, but he is describing in detail the death of Jesus by Roman crucifixion. 
Later on, there's another person that comes along, Mara Bar um, Serapian. He's uh, a person who wrote a book called The Anti-Nicene Fathers, translations of the writings of the fathers down to 325 AD. Now, he's a little bit later on after the apostles, but the thing is, he's writing history, and he's recording from historical sources that he has that Jesus was indeed killed by Roman crucifixion. And some of these guys actually mentioned that it was Pontius Pilate who did it under the reign of Tiberius Caesar. It all fits perfectly with the Bible. Even the Jews, the Jewish Talmud in the Sanhedrin 43a, which was written around 190 AD, it too talks about the murder of Jesus um, as talking about him being crucified. It is actually in there. Uh, another Jew, um, Flavius Josephus, very famous Jewish historian, um, lived in the latter part of the Apostles, fought against the Romans, and he wrote a very popular book, it's in public domain today, called The Antiquities of the Jews. Book 18, chapter 3.3, he talks about the death, the murder of the king of the Jews, the Jesus, and he talks about him being crucified. He also talks about John the Baptist and other things. So we, we hear a lot from sources, and uh, there's more ancient sources. We don't have time on this right now, but there are so many other ancient Roman historians that wrote about the death of Jesus as a historical event. We don't have to just take the Christian word for it. Non-Christian, Roman, and Greek sources also mention this. And even today, we have new theories popping up every now and then, and um, there's an organization called the Jesus Seminar. Sounds like a Christian organization. They're often used on CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, etc., um, around Christmas and Easter time, and they are supposedly <clears throat> experts on the life of Jesus. They're not Christians. Um, one of their leaders, John Dominique Croissant, who is a former Catholic priest, um, and he's one of the leaders of this seminar. He wrote a book back in 1991 called, called Jesus, a Revolutionary Biography. On page 145 in his book, he actually talks about the murder of Jesus. And he, he says, the death of Jesus by crucifixion is as sure as anything historical can ever be. There is so much documentation on it. So, just with that, I believe we've, I mean, we could go on further and further, but I think we have made the point here that there are a lot of independent non-Christian citations that Jesus did die under the hands of the Romans by crucifixion. Now, once we get that, now that we have Jesus dead, now we can get to the point of, well, let's talk about a resurrection. So, and what we're going to start off with is, as we look at this, there were people who claimed to see the risen Jesus. These are what we would call, like in a court case, these are direct eyewitnesses, which um, that's admissible evidence in a court. And who are we talking about? We're primarily talking about the disciples and other followers of Jesus. Now, this is not the same as like those of you who are, are a little older might think after the death of Elvis back in the 70s, people would every now and then say, oh, I saw Elvis at the airport, or oh, I saw Elvis sitting in a bar or something. Like, we're not talking like that. That's not what we're, we're doing here. The disciples and dozens of others are listed in Scripture by name, by name, saying that they saw the risen Lord. They actually saw him. They ate with him. They talked with him. They touched him. And we are given a name. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and talks about over 300 witnesses, eyewitnesses, actually saw Jesus, talked with him, ate with him, talked, you know, all this kind of contact. And there was no doubt in people's mind because he even carried the scars of, of the crucifixion. So many of these, and this is what's really interesting, a lot of people don't quite catch. Many people throughout the New Testament who are witnesses, eyewitnesses of seeing the risen Lord, are mentioned by name. Now, why would the writers mention them by name? Because these letters are being circulated in the first century to go out, and so they name certain people with the purpose, you don't believe my story? Go check it. Here's where the person lives. This is the person's name. Go find out yourself and hear it for yourself if you don't believe what I'm writing you. That's why there was there. And there's over 300. That's a lot of people. I mean, Jesus was only around for 50 days after the crucifixion, but over 300 people in many different areas, they saw him, both in Jerusalem and up in Galilee. Now, what we're going to do next, and the way that we're going to finish this off, is we're going to take a look at the different theories that skeptics will come up with and have come up with to try to explain 
the crucifixion and the resurrection. Well, the crucifixion, not so much, but the resurrection. Trying to explain, how do you explain the resurrection? And this is a, a question I often, when I am with skeptics, um, as evidence for faith, or even just being a Christian, going all the way back when I was teaching high school back in Illinois in the 80s and 90s, I would come across, sometimes it was students, but sometimes adults would say, um, I don't believe in uh, Jesus' resurrection. And I would ask them, well, then explain to me what you think happened. Because everything that uh, historically shows, he did resurrect. He, he was resurrected. He rose and the grave is empty. Matter of fact, I lead tours and you can join, one of, uh, join us on a tour. I co-lead a tour with Dr. Stephen Notley, a uh, very famous, renowned um, Bible scholar, New Testament scholar and archaeologist. And we are going this coming January. We're going to be going to Israel on a tour. I will take you right to the tomb of Jesus. And, and you can walk in there yourself if you want. And you're going to see, as I have many times going in there, he ain't in there. You know what's so cool about that? You go to the tomb of Confucius, guess what? He's in there. You go to the tomb of Muhammad, guess what? He's in there. You go to the tomb of Buddha, guess what? He's in there. Not so with Christianity. You go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, guess what? He ain't in there. Because he rose again. And that's what this is. So I love when I come across skeptics, not being mean, I'm just curious. How do you explain this? How do you explain this problem that, that you would have against Christianity with the resurrection? Like I said, if you can destroy the whole idea of the resurrection, Christianity just falls apart. This is what it's based upon. So how do you explain it? So over the years, what I have done, when I have come across students or adults or whatever who have come up with an idea, I jotted it down. I started doing this back in the 90s, and I would jot it down, and then I would sit and I would study this idea. I'd look up the sources if they had something they're trying to pull from. I would read them, and then I would compare with what we have from historical records and also from Scripture and logic. Logic has a lot to do with this one. Um, which is what we're going to see here. So logically, let me show you, using logic, how the resurrection is true. Now, here's one of the cases that, that people have used uh, to explain the resurrection. They say that the Jewish leaders had, or still have, the body of Jesus, but they hid it, or they keep it hidden. When I was uh, a young boy, back when the earth was cooling and was in high school, there was a friend of mine who was a Jew. And I had many conversations. We were good friends. We would talk many times, but um, he, he would many times bash Christianity, and I would ask him to explain things. And he would tell me about Jewish things in his home and, and his religion and stuff, and it, which was fascinating. Well, I remember having a conversation with him one time, and I said, can you explain the resurrection? He says, well, resurrection didn't take place. How do you know that? He says, because we Jews have the body of Jesus. We keep it hidden. And I asked him, now, Jewish uh, people generally do not like Christians. Um, and so if you really want to destroy Christianity, you say you've got the body of Jesus and it's documented and everything. Why don't you show it and end Christianity? I said, so if the Jews, if you have the body of Jesus, why don't you display it? Because that'll put an end to Christianity once and for all. And you guys are all done with it. He couldn't give an answer. He, he never could answer that question. Because it doesn't make logical sense. If the Jews want to destroy Christianity, which they, they did, and some Jews even to this day really have disdain on Christians. Um, I mean, I don't have that against Jews. I, I worship a Jew. I, I like Jews. I love to go to Israel and sit and commune and talk with Jews. And I have Jews that are you know, phenomenal friends of mine. And, uh, but some Jews really don't like Christians. Well, all you have to do to get rid of Christianity is show the body, I said. It's never been done. Why? Because it's not true. They don't have him. His body was not found in a tomb. Matter of fact, at Pentecost, just think back in the book of Acts, the beginning, the opening parts of, of the book of Acts is talking about Pentecost, the birth of the church. Peter gets up and preaches a sermon. Now, who's present at this? You have Jews from all over the world here because it's Pentecost. It's one of the required holidays for people to come to the temple. So there's people from everywhere, Jews from all over the world. Plus, there's Romans who have even participated in the death of Jesus. They're standing around, and you have the Jewish high priests, the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees. They're all standing there, too. Peter stands up, starts preaching a sermon, which the people are listening to. Thousand people listening to him preach. And he's telling them that Jesus 
rose from the grave, that he is alive, that he was resurrected. Now, how did all the people, these Jews who put him to death, the Romans, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, how did they react? Read it next. They say nothing. You see, all they had to do was produce the body of Jesus right there at Pentecost, just open up the tomb, pull it out, show everybody, oh, here's, here's your Messiah. He's dead. He's still dead. He's not resurrected. You see, that would have put an end to Christianity right there, but they didn't. All of them, even the Romans standing there, everybody remained silent. Some have actually written that silence by the Jewish leaders on Pentecost was one of the loudest silences in history because they could have stopped everything if they had the body of Jesus, and they didn't. Besides that, Jesus was wrapped up and put into a tomb, hurriedly, but he was wrapped up. Yet, when his tomb was found to be uninhabited, his body gone, all of the grave cloths and stuff were still sitting in an arranged manner. If body was taken out and hid or something like this, no one's going to stand there and take the time to unwrap the body and fold it all the things really nicely and put it back. Thieves don't do that. I've been robbed a couple of times in my life. Once, um, the worst one I ever had was when I was uh, living in the Bahamas and teaching school one day. Um, I had a knock at the door. It was the principal and telling me you need to go over to your home because your apartment has been um, vandalized and it is, you've, you've been robbed. I go there, open up my door into my apartment. My apartment was just in shambles. Drawers pulled out. Um, linens all over the place, towels, everything. I mean, they just, they trashed the entire place. That's how thieves act. I mean, how many thieves, I've never heard of a thief um, going in, quickly trying to steal something so they don't get caught, because there's a lot of people. It's in the middle of the day, in the middle of the morning, all this was going on. So there's a lot of traffic around here. I lived right by the school. So there's a lot of people, yet um, they, they tore everything apart and left it that way. No thief stood around like, oh, we pulled out the drawer. Well, let's put this back in. Oh, let's fold all of his T-shirts and, and his socks and everything. Let's put everything back the way we... They don't do that. Jesus' resurrection, when this happened, when his body is found not to be in the tomb, everything was neatly still arranged. That's not how thieves operate. No. So this doesn't fit. This doesn't make any sense that the Jewish leaders have the body or had the body of Jesus and they just hid it. Makes no sense, particularly with Pentecost. Well, look at a second idea that has been proposed. The disciples stole the body and then lied about this whole resurrection thing. So the disciples stole the body. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Think for a moment. Um, if you ever get a chance to read, there's a classic book you should read called Fox's Books, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a classic. It's in public domain. Um, it's an excellent book that talks about the deaths of the early Christians and the tortures that they endured and stuff. And it, it's, it's a remarkable book. And in some cases, it really makes a major impact on Christians, which is, I'm sure, why he wrote this. But the disciples were tortured to renounce their claim. All 12 of the disciples were tortured. Even John, who died of old age, he was still tortured by the Romans. Um, in one case, they said he was put into a pot of like boiling oil and stuff, but he survived it somehow. Um, scarred, but he still survived and, and died in old age in exile. But the thing is, the disciples were, were tortured and in many cases, they were all executed, some of them in the most hideous ways. Some were crucified on a cross. Some um, were shot arrows. Others were tied up in a, um, a sack and thrown over. Some were dragged through the city streets until they were dead behind horses. There was all sorts of things. In all these cases, when the disciples are being tortured before their death, and even when they have their death occurring, they willingly died without renouncing what they had seen, what they had seen, what they had touched, what they had heard, because they all claim to see the risen Lord. So they refused, even under torture, even under crucifixion, they refused to renounce the risen Lord.
Now, some might say, and I've heard this discussion before, people have said, just because a person is willing to die for a cause doesn't make it so. As some people have said, uh, there are some Muslims that um, will strap C4 to their chest, go into a restaurant, blow themselves up. And you see, they're dying for their cause. But I, there's a little problem with the logic here. You see, to be tortured and flogged Roman style, and then to be humiliated more, a uh, little bit more torture, and then they nail you to a cross and put you on there, and you endure hours and hours of misery, undescribable pain and shame on uh, the cross as you're being crucified, as some of these people were. That's not the same as strapping C4 explosives to your chest and detonating it with a, uh, a cell phone. You are instantly vaporized when that kind of thing happens. I mean, you're just gone. You're, you die instantly. Many um, biologists and physicians don't even think the brain can register what happens in that type of a death where on crucifixion, you're very much aware of what's going on. So dying by crucifixion, by that type of torture, that does make a statement because all these guys had to do is just say, I lied. I never saw Jesus alive and they could have got off scot-free. Not one of the early Christians did this. Not one. That's quite a testimony right there. Also, here's another question for you. How could these 12 disciples steal the body? How could they do that? How could they remove the stone? Why is this a problem? Well, there was Roman guards there. Remember, the Jews put Roman guards there. There's a contingent of Roman soldiers which would be standing there, and they would not allow a bunch of fishermen to come by and say, you know, uh, we're, we want to steal the body. Oh, sure, go ahead. You know, they're not going to do that because they would be executed for derelict of duty here if that happened. So how could the disciples go and remove the stone, get the body out without these Romans who are standing there watching this thing day and night? How could they do that? Or some might say, well, oh, these were all, uh, these disciples and stuff, they, they stole the body because they overpowered the Romans in, in doing this. Oh, <laughs> do you remember what the occupation of most of these disciples of Jesus was? Fishermen. Who are they going up against? Trained soldiers. Trained soldiers in the Roman army know how to use a sword. <laughs> Obviously, the disciples are not very good at it. If you'll recall... In the gospel accounts, Peter does take out a sword and displays his <clears throat> sword skills, his saber skills and, and, and stuff. And as he's trying to kill someone, all he does is cut off an ear. He's not the best swordsman, obviously. Um, could you imagine 12 fishermen going up against trained soldiers, soldiers armed with swords, armed with spears, and saying, you guys want to take me on? You know, I mean, come on. These disciples were big scaredy cats, too. They were in hiding. That is not, that is not even logical that they could do this because they're not going to take out these, these Roman soldiers. No, so this doesn't make sense. Um, and uh, besides that, as we see here, these disciples uh, or these Romans would be executed if this happened. They would be executed for it. Now, there's more to this. This theory doesn't support a couple of things. If the disciples stole the body and then just lied about it, Paul was, formerly called Saul, was the enemy of the Christians. He was a Christian hunter and he executed Christians. He doesn't have any loyalty to Christ. He's trying to destroy Christianity. Yet he has a miraculous conversion, a supernatural conversion. What converted Paul? Was it an empty tomb? No. It was seeing the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. That changed him. The guy who was sent to kill Christians now becomes one of the leaders of Christianity. Doesn't make logical sense. If the disciples stole the body, why would Paul convert? There's no logic to that whatsoever. And not just Paul. Jesus had a brother named James. And we know from early writings and even from the gospel, James was not a follower of Jesus. His brothers and family thought he'd lost, Jesus had lost his mind. Um, Jesus was like the black sheep of the family. They didn't understand him as being the Messiah. James was a skeptic. Yet, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to James, and James now converts and becomes the leader of the Christian church. 
See, the empty tomb, if the disciples just stole the body, how do you explain that? Because it wasn't the empty tomb that did it. It was seeing the risen Lord. So James, not being a Christian, turns to Christianity because he saw the Lord, not because of an empty tomb. No, that's what did it. And plus, you have all these other eyewitnesses that have been mentioned um, in the Bible. There's hundreds of them. And none of them. It wasn't the empty tomb that did it. It was seeing the risen Lord. Now, let's go to a third idea that some skeptics will have. Well, then, if it wasn't the disciples that stole the body, then somebody else must have stole the body. Well, again, the disciples were tortured about their claim of seeing the risen Lord, not the empty tomb. They didn't understand the empty tomb. Peter and John went there, looked in. They didn't quite catch what was going on. They didn't even understand it. It wasn't seeing the empty tomb. It was seeing the risen Lord seeing Jesus alive, him displaying the wounds on his body. That's how they believed, and they died willingly, refusing to renounce what they had seen. They had seen the risen Lord Jesus. That someone else stole the body, that still doesn't explain how some people, whoever they were, would sneak up to the Roman guards that are standing there, and the guards would be changed at every time of the changing the guards. The guards were fresh every time. It doesn't explain how the, the stone could be moved with the guards standing right there. This doesn't make any sense logically either. This theory doesn't, in no way does it support the dramatic change that you see in Paul's life. Why would he convert? Because he's not in any type of uh, friendly relationship with Jesus. He wasn't a follower or anything. He's trying to put him to death. And he was putting Christians to death. And not only him, James. Why would James convert? It was seeing the risen Lord. And again, this doesn't explain all the eyewitnesses that are stated in Scripture to have seen the risen Jesus. So it's so illogical that someone else stole the body. Well, let's take a look at a fourth idea that has been presented to me. The disciples went to the wrong tomb. Now, this is a very interesting one. Uh, that the disciples went to the wrong tomb is actually a modern theory. It has really gained prominence in just the last few, maybe two, uh, the most three decades from a college professor of history who wrote a book about this and talks about that that's how the um, Christianity started is the disciples all went to the wrong tomb, found it empty, then went around proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead, that they went to the wrong tomb. And she adds um, her support for this, supposed support for this idea, is that she states the Romans under Pilate were crucifying thousands of people each year. Thus, they had to bury so many people, and they couldn't keep track of all of the people they were burying. Thus, the disciples, not, uh, just unwittingly, went to the wrong tomb. Well, the problem with this, if you study ancient history and the period that Pilate was reigning, yes, Pilate at times was very ruthless. There's no question about it. But during the time period, this Passover season when Jesus was being crucified, there's no recorded instances of Pilate doing mass executions on people. So history, this is a history professor who's proposing this, history itself doesn't support this. Also, look at this. Pilate gave specific orders that the tomb of Jesus not only be identified, but that it be officially sealed for Rome. The Jewish leaders came to Pilate and said, hey, the guy said he was going to rise again in three days. We want you to put a, uh, a contingent of Roman soldiers there. And Pilate says, okay, I'll do that. And would you seal the tomb? Now, when it says seal the tomb, it's not taking a caulking gun and going along the edges. That's not what this is talking about. By sealing the tomb meant that they would put plaster. Where the stone is rolled into place, they would then put a dab of plaster on one side, dab of plaster on the other with a cord probably a scarlet cord with the symbol of Rome on it, hanging there, and now this becomes the property of Tiberius Caesar. But not just was that sealing it, Pilate then would have had his signet ring placed into the plaster on both sides, and when he does this, now it is officially the property of Rome. For if anybody now touches that tomb, they are violating Roman law, and the punishment for that is death. So, to disregard this order, um, if someone was to come over and get into the tomb, right there, that's a penalty of death. But, you know what's really interesting about this? Um, 
to put this seal on any other tomb would have been wrong. See, just picture this for a second. The Jewish leaders come to Pilate. They ask for the tomb to be sealed. Roman guards be put there. Pilate agrees and does this. He t would give the, um, this order to a centurion. The centurion would take a, uh, the troops over. They would seal this. Pilate's ring would be applied to it and everything. But the thing is, the Romans knew right where the tomb was. To put this seal on any other tomb that the centurion, like, I'm not sure which one it was in. Hey, how about we pick that one over there? <laughs> if they found out it was wrong, it'd be his head. He would be beheaded. Um, or if he's not a Roman citizen, he could be crucified himself. No centurion, no Roman soldier is going to take that lightly. So, in other words, they knew, the high priest knew, Pilate knew where the tomb of Jesus was. That's what we gain from that one. Even the Jewish leaders who, who were behind this, the death of Jesus... They never claimed this. As I said, this is a modern theory. All through ancient history, nobody, and even into modern history, nobody has ever claimed that the reason to explain the resurrection, they went to the wrong tomb, because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit histor um, his historically, and it, it doesn't make logical sense either. Because remember, the, the disciples were not convinced by seeing an empty tomb, but by seeing the appearance of Jesus. Paul was not convinced by seeing an empty tomb. It was by seeing a living Jesus. James was not converted by seeing an empty tomb. It was by seeing the living Jesus. And as I said, there's no ancient sources that claim this, that ever claim the disciples went to the wrong tomb. And by the way, just one more point on this. Jesus was placed in a brand new tomb that had just been made for a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph is one who helped bury him. Don't you think Joseph would know where his tomb was? I mean, isn't that logical sense? He must have been a wealthy person to have this type of tomb made. And as it's being constructed, no doubt he went and visited it at times, making sure that he's getting his money's worth. Wouldn't Joseph know where his tomb was? No, the disciples all knew. There's no question. So this is illogical. Let's go to the next idea. Another answer to some of these that some skeptics will make are, or uneducated people who have not thought this out logically, um, they will say that Jesus did not actually die on the cross. He only appeared to be dead. Now, sometimes this is called the swoon theory, that he only appeared to be dead. Hmm. Well, let's see how this stands up to logic. It does not explain, if Jesus just appeared to be dead, and, and, and such, that doesn't explain Paul's conversion of seeing the risen Lord in a supernatural event and the change in his life. That doesn't make sense. That just doesn't fit. Um, and the same thing here with James. James, um, it, uh, seeing Jesus with his wounds and stuff, would it makes sense that, or to him that these are fatal wounds. And what do we mean by that? Well, the Roman centurion in charge, remember during the crucifixion, the Roman centurion um, is given orders from Pilate to go break the legs of the three men who are being crucified, Jesus, of course, in the middle. They go up to, the, to one, they go up to another, they're still alive, they break the legs. They go up to Jesus and they don't break his legs. Actually, that's a, a prophecy from the Old Testament that the Messiah would be sacrificed in such a way, but he would not be have any bones broken. So they didn't break his bones. Instead, the centurion sends word back to Pilate saying, no, um, he's already dead. We don't have to break his bones. Pilate, though, wants to confirm it, if you'll see. And when you read the scripture, he confirms it. He orders that they double check to make sure. So the centurion is sent back to verify and certify the death of Jesus on the cross. What does he do? He takes a spear and he stabs him into the heart. John recalls or, or writes that blood and water flow, water being the transudate around the heart, pericardial fluid, it looks just like water. This is a fatal wound. So what they're doing, they're not just going up and like pinpricking him to see if he's going to have a reflex, they're making a fatal stabbing wound into the heart um, from through a lung right into the heart. So this test shows without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was dead. No question about it. 
Even if he wasn't, that would be the fatal wound that would have killed him, but he was already dead. So there's no question this idea that Jesus uh, just swooned or fainted on the cross. No, he was dead, and the Romans verified it with the stab test. Back in 1879, there was a report that was written. Uh, it's called the Strauss Report. Actually, you can download this for free on the internet. It's in public domain. And it's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. That even if Jesus did swoon or faint on the cross and appeared to be dead, he was in no condition to get himself unwrapped push the stone aside, walk out somehow without the guards noticing him, and then walk around visiting the disciples and then meeting the disciples 60 miles away up in Galilee. How could his feet even do that? How could he even unwrap himself with the wounds in his hands? It makes no logical sense whatsoever. Jesus would be unable to do these things. There's no question. Jesus was dead. So that's that one. Or there's a similar theory, though, I have to touch on about this Jesus didn't die, that I've had some people actually tell me. Um, I don't know where this came from. I can't find the origin of it, but I've heard it by more than one individual. Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was drugged. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I don't mean to be facetious here or anything, but it's, it's just so illogical. Because they say that Luke, who was a physician, would know what drugs to give Jesus. And somehow he gave Jesus a drug that made him appear to be dead to everybody watching. But then they put him in the tomb. He's still alive, but he's fainting dead. And then later on, on Sunday morning, um, Dr. Luke goes back with Joseph of Arimathea. They open up the tomb and they give him the antidote. And then Jesus walks out. Well, let me tell you, Jesus didn't do drugs. He didn't. Remember on the cross even? While he was being... Suffering on the cross, he cries out um, that I thirst, and they tried to give him stuff. He didn't take that. And even before, they put the nails in him. The Romans commonly gave a mixture to the person that they're crucifying of alcohol mixed with gall, which is a part of a, like an opiate. It's sort of like giving him a, a narcotic and to help us. They're going to start throwing the, the nails in. And so they, it, it was a little bit of a mercy thing that the Romans did. But Jesus refused it. Jesus didn't do drugs. That's true. It's in the Bible. He didn't do drugs. So the Romans, by the way, the, this theory falls apart in so many logical ways. First of all, the Romans carrying out the crucifixion had to be present the whole time. All right. The centurion had to be overseeing this with the contingents of soldiers standing around. And some of them were sitting at the foot of the cross, it says, even gambling for his clothing and stuff. I mean, they're all there. They're watching this. They're making sure that nobody's trying to take him down or anything. There's a lot of people standing around. There's followers of Jesus standing around. There's people who are skeptics of Jesus standing around. So when did Dr. Luke get the opportunity to give Jesus a drug? What did he do? Go up and say, hey, everybody, look over there and then go up and give the drug? That's so illogical, really. Also, the Romans are experts in death. When the centurion tested him, he comes back to Pilate. To make a lie to Pilate, particularly Pilate, as ruthless as this guy was, that'd be your head. No, they're gonna report the right thing. Stabbing him with a spear in the heart, that is dead. Romans, and particularly centurions, no dead. Jesus was dead. Doesn't explain the stab test. It doesn't explain the Strauss report, how Jesus could have walked around then afterwards, walking 60 miles. What kind of drug did he give him? No, this, this whole theory falls apart. There's, there's no logic to it. Here's another one that's sort of popular. This has become popular since the, oh, say, early 1900s. And uh, before this, this was not really found in, in uh, ancient history and stuff, but it's become sort of a modern thing. That in grief, his um, Jesus' disciples and his followers were all just hallucinating. And that's what this was. That was a hallucination that um, uh, his, you know, Peter, James, John, and all of them, that they were just hallucinating seeing Jesus and sitting down, having meals with them and, and stuff and talking and touching him. It was all hallucination. Well, let's just look at this logically. Now, I am no expert in psychology. I'm not. Um, I've taken counseling courses. Um, I have no master's degree in it. Um, but I have had enough psychology to know this. That psychology says hallucinations are not contagious. They're not. So you're going to try and tell me over 300-something people are all having the same hallucination? 
That doesn't make sense. It, it's illogical. Also, if they even if they are hallucinating, explain the empty tomb. I've been in there. I wasn't hallucinating seeing that the bench is empty. It doesn't, if, if they're hallucinating because they're in grief, why would Paul be grieving? He wasn't loyal to Jesus. He's an enemy of Jesus. Why would he be hallucinating? James, James was not a follower when Jesus was doing his ministry. Why would he be grieving? Probably when James saw Jesus on the cross, he felt sorry for his mom, Mary, but Jesus and probably the other brothers and sisters were like, yay, finally, the black sheep's done of the family. You know, we can start showing our faces in public. No, James is not grieving for this either. So this doesn't explain him. And plus, over 50 days, Many people, both singularly and in large groups, testified that they saw the risen Jesus, they ate with the risen Jesus, and that they touched the risen Jesus. That's quite a bit of evidence. Well, let's take a look at one more. I've had one more, um, and, and there have been other things, but they really fall into those other categories we've already mentioned. There's one more that has been used frequently with me. Uh, people will come up and they say, well, we don't believe in the resurrection because the four Gospels vary and are not reliable. Well, even so, that doesn't really fit the <laughs> why, why Jesus is not in the tomb anymore. But anyway, we'll, we'll take a look at this. The four Gospels account, uh, they all vary and are not reliable. Now, first of all, it is true that four people can look at the same painting in an art museum and all walk away seeing different things. And the thing is, they're all true. I have actually um, stood at the Art Institute in Chicago looking at a painting with some other friends of mine. And then we walked away and we started talking about it. And I remember them saying, because I point out something I saw and they say, oh, I didn't see that. Another person said, I didn't see this. And then they would say, oh, I saw this. And I said, wow. I didn't see that. Or have you ever been to a movie and someone says, oh, did you see this in a movie? And you don't see it in the movie um, because, I mean, it might be in, it's, it's in the film, but you don't watch it. So just because you have four different opinions on things, as they call it, that doesn't mean it's not true that Jesus was not resurrected. You see, harmony is not how the four gospels were written. They're not biographies. They're portraits portraits. So the sequence of events are not important. They, each writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all painting a special portrait dealing with an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Ezekiel chapter 1 about the four facets of the Messiah. Um, they focus on it. Matthew, his gospel is focusing primarily on the Messiah being the king who fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Mark is focusing on the, uh, the Messiah being a servant. So Mark has more about what Jesus did, not as much as what Jesus says. Luke is focusing on the humanity of the Messiah, that Jesus is human. You see the pathos. You see the stories and the, the feelings of Jesus. Then you get to John, who his portrait is all about how Jesus is God. And that's what he focuses on. So they're they're not biographies. You want to know what biography is? Here's a biography. Here's a biography of Lord Nelson. Um, died in 1805. Um, great British admiral. And look at how much is in here. You see all this information about this guy. And it has his, his parents, his birth, his toddler's age, going into adolescence, going into his teen years, his post-teen years, young adult, all the way up to even his death. And even a little bit after his death. Great book on Nelson, if you want to read. Or look at this one. Here's most people know Doc Holliday. Great, great biography. Love this biography on Doc Holliday, The Life and the Legend. It's a great book. The thing is, it's a biography. It talks about his parents, his growing up as a child, as a baby and stuff in Georgia, how he went to med school to learn to be a, a dentist, um, how he uh, went through his teen years, his post teen years, etc., his adulthood and everything, going to finally his death. It has all this information. Or here's another one. Now, those are two very famous characters. You notice, do you notice how thick these books are? Now, look at this. Here's a character I doubt many of you have ever heard of. Um, this is the life of Captain Woods Rogers. He was the first royal governor of the Bahamas. Look how thick it is. Now, this is a more obscure person in history, not like Doc Howley or Lord Nelson. This is a more obscure person, but look how much is in here. And it talks about his life, his childhood, et cetera, et cetera, going all the way through to his death. 
has all different aspects of his life, his teen years, his young years, how he was the third person to circumnavigate the, the world. Um, he was a pirate hunter. And look at the size of that. Or here's another one. This is Lord Cochrane. This is uh, a book on another. Probably hardly anybody's heard of him. Uh, a very well-known, in, in certain circumstances, military history of a British uh, captain, sea captain, frigate captain, and actually uh, going all the way up into Admiral. Here's his life and all the details. Look how thick this book is. All the details, talking about his parents, his birth, his childhood, his adolescence, how he started to go to sea, how he worked at sea, how he worked his way up from seamen all the way up into being the ship's captain and then beyond. Uh, one of the greatest frigate commanders ever in the latter uh, 1700s of, of England. Now, look at the size of those, but now let me show you something. Let's take a look at the book of, we'll, we'll take one of these, what they say is a biography of, say, the book of Mark, okay? So here's the end of Mark. And here in my Bible, oh, I went too far. I've already passed the beginning of it. Um, we're going to go back and look at just a couple of pages here. And pardon me as I set this down for a second. And trying to get to the beginning of Mark, <laughs> you're going to see, yeah, this is really skinny. Now, as I hold this up, I want you to see, here is the book of Mark. Does this look like a biography? This is not a biography. Matthew is not much bigger. Luke's not much bigger. John's much big, not much bigger. You know, something has nothing in Mark. There's absolutely nothing about the birth of Christ or his parents. There's nothing about his childhood. There's nothing about his adolescent years. There's nothing about his teen years. There is nothing in here um, about anything in his life until he turns to the age of 30. And then Jesus died at the age um, like three and a half years later. Um, so that's a very short period of time. That is not a biography. So these are not biographies. These books are not biographies. They're portraits of who the Messiah would be fulfilling the prophecies from the Old Testament. Besides, why would we need four biographies saying the same thing? No, we see the four aspects, the four facets, the four portraits of the Messiah. That's what these are. So they're not biographies. They don't fit the requirements, literally, to be a biography. So you can't use it that way. That's why they vary. It's not that they're disagreeing, they're focusing on a different aspect of Jesus's life pertaining to the portrait that you're trying to do. So that's how that goes. We see these kind of things. Um, the four gospel accounts, very not reliable. They're not biographies. That's why they're focusing on these four aspects from an Old Testament prophecy. Well, the whole conclusion as we wrap this up, the whole thing about this, Jesus did live Jesus was crucified. Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus is alive today. The tomb is empty. The evidence, logic, dictates that he is alive, that he resurrected, that he is alive. Logic dictates, because he did this, and nobody else has been able to do it, that he is God. So these things add tremendous evidence as we've looked through. So what we've done is we've taken a look at what skeptics commonly say as an excuse for not to believe. And we have just showed you through logic, none of those make any sense, logically. They're all illogical. The only thing that makes sense, the only thing that the logic dictates is that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive today. He is the Messiah, no question about it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, this segment and um, if you have questions or comments, I'd love uh, you to contact us through our website on this. And um, really sit and look. For one thing, I hope you realize a little bit about the four Gospels. Um, we'll have a lesson on our website um, talking sometime about these four portraits of the Messiah. Um, but this is just absolutely amazing stuff, how logic shows the, ex, uh, the, the resurrection really did take place. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again and we'll see you on the next episode.